Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was just reflecting on the, oh, when I was on the way here to Delhi yesterday. It's actually a little over 20 years since I first came here uh, uh, for a business reason. And at that time, I was working with uh, in the airline industry, helping airlines uh, with crisis communications. In other words, protecting their reputation. And the big challenge at that time was not social media. It was 24-hour rolling cable and satellite TV channels. CNN. Nobody had even thought about social media at that time. Today, we live in a very, very different environment. Now, my day job, uh, as, uh, as you've just been told, is I run a PR agency in Singapore, that's Ketchum. Uh, but I also spend a lot of time working with airlines and hotel groups and other clients on defending reputation. As I said, the, the challenge of both building and defending reputation, to my mind, has never been more challenging uh, than it is today. So why is that? Well, to say the obvious, it's because of social media. But it's not just because of social media. We're all familiar with the proliferation of these channels, how important they are, how many people use them. But it's not just about that. It's also about the challenge of mobility, visibility. I'm going to show you two pictures, which I think illustrate very graphically the journey that we're, that we're on at the moment. This picture was taken outside St. Peter's Basilica in Rome in 2005, and this is a crowd of mourners waiting to greet the cortege of the former Pope John Paul II. This is a picture taken eight years later in the same location, a crowd waiting to greet the new Pope, Pope Francis. Now, in two images side by side, that shows you how far we've come. Now, we've always been able to take pictures, so why is this important? It's because the underlying technology our social media also allows us to share our pictures, our pictures and our images. And again, we've been on a quite extraordinary journey in the last 15 years. 15 years ago, the standard for most telco operators around the world was 2G. And 2G allowed you to use voice transmission, text, and very slowly, still images. Where are we now? 5G. Now this might sound like science fiction, but the first 5G networks are already operating. They're already operating in the Middle East, in Qatar, in Australia, parts of Northern Europe. And believe it or not, Africa has its first, first 5G network right now in a country called Lesotho in Southern Africa. So the point of that little example is that in some parts of the world, developing countries especially, communities that have never had fast broadband internet are going to go straight to 5G. That's the new standard. <clears throat> These technologies already exist, they're already operating, and just look at the, the amount of speed. And what this, what this, this graphic shows you is two things. It's speed and capacity. So very, very fast state of transmission, which means images from anywhere, video images, and increasingly, live streaming. Now, why does live streaming matter in terms of protecting reputation? Well, look at this. As I said, I've worked with probably about 60 airlines now. I haven't worked with Southwest Airlines. Uh, I do currently work with IATA. Uh, one of the things I do with IATA is a, a best practice initiative where every two years, uh, IATA publishes a set of guidelines. I just submitted uh, the last, the, the 2018 edition. I submitted that last week uh, when I was in Geneva with IATA. And it looks at how has the environment changed? And what are the things that airlines in particular but also not just airlines, but also uh, other aviation companies, the manufacturers, the airports, regulatory authorities, air traffic control. What are the things that they need to know about how the environment has changed and how has best practice evolved in terms of how you respond? Now, this picture shows something that we'd actually been predicting for a number of years. You didn't have to be a Nostradamus to predict, predict this. And that prediction was the day was going to come when somebody would live stream images from the middle of an unfolding aviation crisis. In other words, from the cabin of the aircraft as the crisis was happening. That moment actually came in April of this year. Now, what happened here, the guy in the, the left of the picture there, a gentleman called Marty Martinez, who's rather, become rather famous. He already had about 2,000 followers on social media. So he's a little bit of a social media star anyway. Now he was on this Southwest Airlines flight uh, from, I think it was from New York to Dallas Love Field. There was a catastrophic engine explosion. Debris penetrated uh, the cabin, smashed one of the windows, and unfortunately, a passenger was partially sucked out of the window and killed. 
Uh, that was actually the first fatality on a US commercial airline flight since 2009. Big news. Even bigger news was the fact that Martin Martinez, uh, that he thought the aircraft was actually going to crash because it, they initiated an, an emergency descent. The aircraft ultimately landed safely. But on the way down, he thought his last moment had come. So what did he do? He pulled out his wallet, got out a credit card, connected to the $8, paid the $8 charge to connect to the onboard Wi-Fi, and fired up Facebook Live so he could say his last goodbyes to his family. That actually, actually went live on Facebook about eight minutes into the incident. How do we know that? Because about nine minutes into the incident, Southwest Airlines started getting calls from journalists. Now, how did this social media phenomenon make the leap into the mainstream media. But if you've never heard of a company called Data Miner, trust me, you will. This is a, one of the fastest growing fintech startups in the world. It started actually in the intelligence world, but it's, now, it's made the transition now into the, the communication world. And what it does, it uses artificial intelligence to make connections between social media posts. So it scans the internet 24 hours a day and it looks for sudden eruptions of social media activity in a given location. And the algorithms that it uses allows it to make connections between those posts. And then it sends an automated alert in real time to all of its subscribers and says, something is going on here, for example, in Mumbai. Something is going on here right now. And how do we know that? Because several hundred people are tweeting or streaming about it. So, who subscribes to Data Miner? Well, for a start, at least 450 major news organizations. CNN, BBC, Sky News, Al Jazeera, wire agencies. This thing is transforming the way in which major news organizations, certainly in, in, in the United States, parts of Europe now, are covering breaking news. Who else subscribes to Data Miner? Well, for a start, major airlines. American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines was prepared for those first calls to come in because it uses data miner and it was seeing the images at the same time as the journalists who were about to call them. So even if it won them a couple of minutes, heads up, that's something. At least when the journalist calls come in, you, you, don't, you, you may not know what, what they're talking about. At least with data miner, you know what they're talking about and you're already on it. Now what happens if you haven't seen the pictures and you don't know what they're talking about? Well, an airline that now uses data miner, but at the time did not, experienced this incident. Can you just roll the video, please? I'm sure you've all seen this video, but I'll show you anyway. Just click on the image response of United Airlines to watch the pretty, pretty alarming, pretty distressing incident. What did they actually say about it? What did their CEO in particular say about it? He apologized for the fact that they had to reaccommodate customers. Did that look like somebody reaccommodating their customers? Would you like to be reaccommodated as Dr. Dow was reaccommodated? Now, you can imagine the reaction to that. And <clears throat> I don't blame at all Oscar Munoz uh, for this. In fact, ironically, I think about two weeks earlier, he'd been named as PR Week's Communicator of the Year in the United States. It just goes to show um, you can very easily uh, lose the crown if you don't know what you're actually talking about. And very clearly, not only Mr. Munoz, but whoever drafted that statement for him had not seen the pictures. Because if you had, how could you possibly define it as reaccommodating customers? Now, not surprisingly, the reaction, and some of it you saw in that video there, was pretty dramatic. Public perception of United Airlines, which was never very high, uh, went off a cliff. Now, the airline sector anyway in the United States is not particularly popular. Any of you who've flown in the United States will know why. But they are now tracking, they are still to this day tracking below the base level of sentiment about the airline sector. But much more significantly, what damage did that do to the business? It wiped over a billion dollars off the value of the company in one afternoon. That is a market reaction, and it's driven entirely by consumer sentiment, especially, and there's a little hint in that video, consumer sentiment in China, which is United Airlines' biggest international market. There was a threat of a consumer boycott of United Airlines because a lot of people thought, and people on social media were talking about, the fact that the passenger was Chinese. He wasn't. He was Vietnamese-American. Nothing to do with China. 
but nonetheless, that's what's driving market sentiment. So not surprisingly, Mr. Munoz had to go out on an apology tour and admit they got it very badly wrong. Not just that, not just their response, but the fact this exposed a fundamental problem at United Airlines, their customer service philosophy, the way they train their staff. And he said, I'm going to fix it. This is on me. So <clears throat> the reputation landscape in the, uh, in the always on era is constantly shifting. Everything is visible, everything. Everybody has an opinion and they can share that opinion very, very quickly. Companies and brands therefore are under constant scrutiny, not just externally, but also internally from your own employees. Issues just like the Dr. Dow saga can escalate very quickly before you even know yourselves what really happened. If you don't have data miner, if you're not using social listening, if you don't have an alerting system, how would you know that the conversation is even happening, much less what, what's everybody talking about? What, are the, what do the pictures show? And if you don't know that, how can you possibly respond in the right way? And lastly, we're seeing new categories of risk. So what are some of the things now that can bite you? Well, disruptive events. We've always had disruptive events. The difference now is there are pictures and everybody then has an opinion about you, how you handled it. Customer service, <coughs> things go wrong. Things go wrong every day for companies and brands. But again, the difference is everybody can see what happened. Everyone hears the story from the point of view of the people who were affected, who were disappointed or angry or upset with you. Cyber security. I was talking to some people from Kaspersky, the uh, security company, just a few weeks ago. They said, do you know something? There are only two, two kinds of companies left in the world now. Those who have already been hacked and those who are about to be. In the airline industry alone, 81% of airlines have now been hacked. Look at Cathay Pacific, the saga that played out in the media just a few weeks ago. 9.4 million customers had their credit card details compromised. Criminal activity, cyber, cyber criminality, which is largely run by organized crime and with some state support in some cases, is now a $1.5 trillion a year business. That's according to CETA. That's twice the size of the entire aviation industry. Now that accounts for about 90% of all cyber activity, cyber threat, but even more sinister is an emerging category which is targeted attacks designed to disrupt infrastructure. In other words, to take you down. Think about WannaCry, that virus that went out. It's not right, ransomware, it's not trying to get anyone's credit card details. It's designed to make you fail. Who's prepared for that? How many companies are truly prepared to deal with that and the reputational impact that it brings? But then there's another whole category of risk, values. In other words, who are you? as a company. Now that's not by any means an exhaustive list and some of them may not be relevant here in India but they are absolutely relevant in many countries around the world. Now you might look at that and think, hang on a second, if we're a firm of accountants for example, why does Me Too matter to us? You think it doesn't? This was in the Times of London yesterday. The big four accountancy firms in London in the UK have lost 37 partners in the last four years because of allegations of sexism and bullying in the workplace. Now, the reason those people have been forced to resign in shame is because those companies have been forced to take a stand, to have a point of view. But it's not enough to have a point of view and to say what your values are, you have to live them. And if you don't, if there's any gap between the, the values that you claim to have and the way in which you actually behave, that's when you end up suffering problems. So why does it matter? Well, 73% of millennials, 77% of Gen Z customers are actually prepared to pay more for products or services from companies dedicated to social and environmental change. Now you might think, this is the snowflake generation. This is the future. This is the future. This is people who are now in their late 30s, from their young, young 20s to their late 30s. This is the future. These people are taking over the world. Companies with a positive employer brand get twice as many applicants as those that don't. And lastly, 50% of people 
would not work for a company with a poor reputation. So think about the war for talent. Again, why does this matter to businesses? Think about it. So how in this, this environment do we maintain trust? Well, first of all, and most important, deliver on your promises. But occasionally, that doesn't happen. So when things go wrong, first of all, make sure you know what just happened. Make sure you're aware of the conversation. Make sure you're in that conversation to rebut it or refute it or to inject some factual information to express your point of view. Respond quickly. We're not talking about the golden hour anymore. We're talking about minutes. You have to respond quickly. You have to be human. Show your human side. Empathize. What was missing from that United Airlines statement about Dr. Dow until way too late? Empathy. You've just seen a guy getting his teeth knocked out and his nose broken on one of your aircraft. And you can't apologize? Own the story, because if you don't, the story will own you. Stay true to your values and make sure you've decided what your point of view is. What does your business stand for? Is it relevant to us or not? There are lots of issues out there. Which ones are we going to own as a business? And lastly, actions. It's not what you say, it's what you do. So actions speak louder than word, words. Do what you say and say what you're doing. Thank you very much.